Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cash Flow Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of uh, connecting with Dan Hanford with Passive Investing. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Dan, I appreciate you taking time today. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to be here, Sakar. Looking forward to sharing and providing some value to your audience. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dan, with Passive Investing, their group owns well over 2,200 doors, uh, asset uh, size well over uh, 275 million. Uh, Dan is a big force in multifamily. Uh, he, along with their group, provide a lot of value and thought leadership to uh, many of the multifamily listeners. So it is always a pleasure to connect with Dan. Uh, so Dan, uh, kind of uh, take it away. I mean, give us some background, how you got started and, you know, what kind of, sort of why you like multifamily in general uh, compared to everything else. Sure. So I'll kind of take it back to when I first started one of my very first successful businesses, which is actually a chiropractic business. So I, when I, I actually am a chiropractor by trade, went to chiropractic college in Atlanta, Georgia at Life University. And while I was there, I had started an online company called shopanatomical.com. And, .com, and mm -hmm. we sold all types of, I mean, we still do. I still have the company today. And so we're now 13 years into it and still have it. Um, we sell all types of skeletons and skulls and brains and hearts and all types of plastic anatomy models for colleges, doctor's offices, and universities across the country. Mm -hmm. And that company that I started there, I did it while I was in college. And when I got out, I was able to start my very first practice and you know, have no debt on that clinic. And even today, kind of fast forward to where we are right now, I have four clinics and they're all debt free and they all are cash flowing nicely. But before I fast forward too closely, too, too fast, but uh, when I first started those clinics in the very beginning, I was working for myself, right? So sure. I'm still working for myself now, but uh, I've, I, I found out earlier on that even though I had my own clinic, because I was still trading time for dollars, sure. I was still kind of stuck in a job because I can only mm -hmm. see so many patients an hour. And so I was limiting my income. Sure. And so I started to learn that really early on. And so I started to hire on some associate chiropractic positions to work for me. And so I, so I didn't have to go in and do all, do all the work all the time, but then started to integrate medicine into it. So we did a lot of, uh, uh, we had, had some nurse practitioners, medical doctors, we had an MDDC clinic. Mm -hmm. And then about four to five years ago, I made the executive decision that if I wanted to grow the clinics, I needed to be able to take out the chiropractic and the rehab because mm -hmm. those are the types of patients that we could help the most, mm -hmm. but we weren't getting referrals from outside chiropractors and physical therapists because those people were afraid to refer to us because they were afraid we we're going to steal their patient because we did, we did those services in our office. So we, we cut those out and it also allowed us to scale up from one clinic to four clinics in a matter of 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it allowed us to be able to scale that fast because we, we, we were able to reduce the footprint. So instead of having a 5,000 square foot office to do everything in, all we needed was about 2,000 square feet. Sure. So we were able to mm -hmm. reduce that footprint, scale up to the four clinics. And then each time we would open up another clinic, you know, my wife would always come up to me and she's like, why are we having to pay more and more money in taxes? You know, <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, it's a good thing, right? Because sure. the more money you pay in taxes, the more money you're making. Sure. And, sure. Uh, and so but then I started realizing that really what I should be doing is investing in real estate. So once I built those four clinics up and we started to write these really large six figure checks to the government, we decided to pivot, to pivot, up, not, not sell those clinics. So we decided to pivot. We still own those clinics hundred percent. They don't have any debt on them or anything. And, but then they cash flow nicely. So we need to find a place to be able to put our money so that we can actually reduce our taxable liability. And that's how I started PassiveInvesting.com, this private equity real estate firm that acquires these large apartment complexes is because of my own selfish reasons, but also I knew that there were other people that were close to me that still were working and they didn't have the time of the luxury of time to be able to go out and find these assets and to be able to invest in these institutional quality assets that are normally reserved for, you know, REITs and hedge funds and large institutional players, sure. but we can come together, pool our resources together and acquire these assets and still get really nice risk adjusted returns. 
Sure, sure. And and it's interesting you mentioned Dan, that there are just so many parallels we can draw between, you know, sort of getting the business on, on, off the ground and you realize you're working so much, you have to sort of delegate some tasks, have some more assistance and of course systems and things like that. So I would be curious to know your thoughts, uh, Dan, about, um, you know, sort of systematizing the business, you know, uh, sort of hiring the people and things like that. Uh, and of course, multifamily in general, as we all know, is a, a breathing, living business with, with you know, lots of uh, resources and systems that are needed. Uh, so could you maybe perhaps uh, kind of uh, tell us how you correlated your experience and thought that, yes, multifamily, besides the tax benefits that you said, uh, was a great fit and you were kind of passionate about getting it up, off the ground and setting the proper systems that are needed for it? Well, I'll tell you, like, earlier on, even before I even uh, had, the, had the real estate side of things, I, that was one of the big hockey stick moments in my business side of my career too, was the fact of being able to learn how to delegate certain tasks because like, like many entrepreneurs, I feel like I can do everything better than everybody else. Sure. <laughs> and I, I had to come to that conclusion and realize that and tell myself that that was an issue that I had. And honestly, today I still feel that way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something I'm going to, I'm going to ever be able to not think about and not change and be able to change. Sure. But, but, but what I can do is, is, mentally play games with myself and say, but if I can hire somebody that can do it about 80 to 85% as good as I can, then I can turn it over to them and I can focus on what I'm really good and skilled and gifted at, which is really the vision side of things and overall strategic objectives, putting in those systems and procedures and processes in place. And so once I, I learned that concept in my other businesses, that's when I had that hockey stick moment. So I knew once I stepped out of that full time to focus on the private equity real estate side of things, that I wanted to make sure I can put in some of these similar systems and procedures and processes in place to number one, protect our investors downside by making sure we have those systems in place for managing and, and for being able to manage those assets, sure. but also to, for me to be able to have my time still, so I'm not having to focus full time efforts and trying to run the, the actual private equity real estate business. And so learn, take and taking the, the, the skills that I learned earlier on in business and incorporating them into this and treating this as a true business is, is really what I think is, has catapulted our success. Sure, sure. No, that, uh, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, there's just so many parallels, as you pointed out. Now, let's talk about, Dan, uh, how did you get started? How, how did you, like, sort of your first deal came about? Sure. So my first couple of deals, first two or three deals were actually partnered with other, other GPs. So mm -hmm. actually partnered with them. We actually helped raise some money, helped uh, do some, some loan guarantor work, started to be on that GP side to be able to get, gain that credibility and mm -hmm. gain that experience, not only for our investors, but also for the sellers and the brokers and the markets that we're wanting to acquire assets. So we need to be able to build up that credibility. But sure. I will say the number one thing was probably the investors because mm -hmm. you know, people thought of me as this business owner in the medical field space, right? And now sure. all of a sudden I'm trying to, trying to talk to them about investing in real estate mm -hmm. and it was hard for them to make that jump and make that leap. But sure. I was able for those first couple of conversations to leverage the experience and the credibility of my partner in that, in that other co-GP role to be able to say, hey, no, this, I'm, I'm actually partnering with this group. They've got over half a billion in their portfolio and they've got X, Y, and Z. And it built my credibility by using their credibility at the same time. Sure. So when I actually had my very first deal that I put together, my very first uh, multifamily deal that I put together was a 130 unit property, $8.9 million. And we were able to raise just over $2 million to acquire that asset. I will say it was the hardest one we've ever raised for because <laughs> we obviously didn't have the investor database built out like we do right now. Sure. Um, and it took us the full probably 60 days to, to be able to get that, that money raised on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but that was our very first deal. It was, a, it was an $8.9 million deal. Had right about $2 million, just under $2 million in CapEx on that one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it's, that, that was one of our very first ones. And then fast forward to today, which I know you and I have talked about this, this deal, but we sure. just closed the deal in the middle of COVID-19, which was a just under 50 million. It was 49.955 million raised sure. right at 19.4 million on that one to acquire it. And uh, in the middle of COVID-19. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. And it's been such a uh, sort of a great experience to see your progress uh, and kind of see the, the, the hockey stick growth that you, your company had. Uh, so speaking of that growth, uh, Dan, um, maybe help us uh, for someone new who's listening and want to get started and is wondering that, boy, these guys are doing such big deals. And here we are trying to, you know, uh, understand what multifamily is about, what are the different markets and things like that. Uh, can you maybe share uh, what would be so, some of your sort of advice for newer folks who are getting started? Should they focus on markets, the deals, or perhaps looking at, uh, you know, passive investors and building that list. Uh, give us some uh, thoughts on that for, uh, if you can. Sure. I would say yes to all of the above. I mean, that's, that's kind of what you have to do is do all of them. I'll tell you the first thing that I did was I hired a mentor. Sure. So I wanted mm -hmm. to have somebody that I had direct access to I could pick up the phone and call them at any time. And I was able to have somebody directly that I could actually call and talk to mm -hmm. to be able to have that reduced learning curve, if you will, during sure. the process. But then one of the first things I did was invest my own money on the LP side. So I can actually sure. experience what it's like to be an investor and be involved on that side of things. But then for somebody getting started, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in that you need to be full time in this business in order to take sure. down your own deals. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and, I, and I know people, some people don't like it when I say that, but I'm just trying, I just try to be direct and honest with people that sure. you need to be full time. You can't be holding on a nine to five job and try to manage multi million dollars worth of people's hard earned money, right? Sure, sure. Um, I would not be able to sleep well at night if I, if I invested in something like that. Sure. But also mm -hmm. if I was the one taking the investor money and I was still working full time somewhere else. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get started in this space by being full time. You can still work your nine to five, but then do what I did in the beginning, co GP with somebody else, passively invest with another group, another operator, and start to learn from your mentor how to do this space. And then sure. once you feel comfortable with it, that's when you can go ahead and once you've built that credibility with a track and have a track record, you can now step away from your full time nine to five and start to take some of these deals down yourself once you've built that track, that track record and you've built that credibility with people. Awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, can I sh share some uh, markets that you uh, invest and in, perhaps why those sort of markets that you like and you invest in? Sure. So the, the markets that our group acquires properties in are markets that we feel are stabilized uh, and, and primarily they have a lot of blue chip corporations in them that help to stabilize the market. Mm -hmm. So I'm located in Columbia, South Carolina. There's not a lot of stability here when it comes to like blue chip corporations. So mm -hmm. guess what? I do not invest in my own neck of the woods, right? I don't I invest see. in Columbia, South Carolina. I get a lot of people that will ask me about, hey, look at this property, look at that property, or give me your opinion. And I tell them, I'm like, I'm not the right guy for that because <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't like Columbia as a market for multifamily, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the two markets on the South Carolina side is, is Greenville, South Carolina and Charleston, South Carolina. Those are only two markets in South Carolina. On the North Carolina side, there's still only two markets. There's the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, the whole triangle area. Sure. And then you have the Charlotte market and the Charlotte MSA. And it's mainly because of the stability of those markets and the strength of those markets. And especially from that blue chip corporation, those, those well-known names and corporations that are in those markets that help create that stability even in a downturn. Sure. Now, uh, related question there, Dan, would be is that obviously the markets that you express there are obviously like a lot of bigger headquarters and blue chip companies are coming in. Uh, the mar I mean, the deal sizes are like quite high, low cap rate environment. But for, you know, obviously there are some secondary markets or perhaps we can say some tertiary pockets as well, where someone can say that, hey, you know what? Uh, some deals are obviously to be found on some of those markets and where the cash flow works and things like that. So can you maybe perhaps share that why you kind of favor the sort of the banner markets or the uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the most talked about cities and why not some of the secondary tertiary pockets in general? Sure. Well, for one, it's, 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 it's about the money, right? So I can make more money in a banner market than I can in some of these secondary or tertiary markets. Mm -hmm. And here's why. So a lot of consultants and coaches and things like that in the space that are considered gurus will tell you to go after these, you know, eight, nine, 10% cap rate markets. Sure. And the, the, it's, it's nice if you were back in 2008, cause you did see a lot of that cap rate expansion. And there were a lot of markets that were like that, sure. but with where the market is right now, even in the middle of COVID-19, you, you have, 
have to really go into some of these tertiary or even quaternary markets to actually find some of these really high cap rates. And it's because of the stability of that market, right? Sure, and sure. so as cap rates compress, the reason why the cap rates are compressing is because there's competition. So the sure. more competition you have, the lower the cap rate's gonna be. Right. And so I'll give you a quick example, just so you and your listeners can kind of understand my thoughts on this. But if I'm looking to spend my own time, energy, and effort trying to improve a property, let's mm -hmm. just say I have property A and a, uh, a, a 5% cap rate market, and I have mm -hmm. property B and in an in a, in a 8% cap rate market. Mm -hmm. If I have similar assets, similar purchase prices, and I'm doing similar CapEx, right? Mm -hmm. And I increase the NOI, that net operating income, on a class and on, on that on that uh, that eight percent cap rate market, mm -hmm. I'm only increasing the value of that property by one point two five million. Now, sure. some of you might go, "Well, that's pretty good. I like one point two five million. Yes, sure. but if you look at the other side, same amount of time, energy, effort, mm -hmm. same renovation, everything else is the same, right? But I'm in a five percent cap rate market. I've actually increased the value of that property by two million dollars. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the reason why we like to be in that 2% cap, not 2% cap rate now, that's pretty low right there. <laughs> to be in the lower cap rate markets is because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that there's still a bunch of people, a lot of competition when we go to sell the asset because it'll continue to drive that cap rate lower or at least keep it as low as we want it to be mm -hmm. and to make sure that we have that good solid exit. Sure, sure. No, that, that makes complete sense. I mean, it's, it's kind of the best return for your uh, sort of your same efforts that you have done, right? Now, speaking of some of the value adds that uh, perhaps you look at, uh, Dan, like what are some of your criteria? Like, like are you looking for some specific metrics in terms of, uh, you know, how much the rent premiums should be uh, for it to make sense? Uh, give us some rundown of uh, perhaps, uh, you know, what you look for in a deal and when, like, you know, what are some of the other factors that you would say that, hey, the deal doesn't make sense uh, for all, all sorts of reasons, whether it's vintage or perhaps there's not much value. I, I give us some thought process on how you kind of synthesize all of this. Sure. So we're very strict on our criteria. And, and the reason why I think it's important to be strict on your criteria is that you're going to start to see a lot of deal flow coming through your email box from a lot of different people, a lot of different brokers. And if you don't have very strict, rigid criteria, you'll just be going down a bunch of different rabbit trails all over the place trying to find the, the right property. And for us, we know what our sweet spot is. So mm -hmm. our goal is there's two different types of assets that we look for. We look for either a B plus with value add, mm -hmm. usually a light to moderate value add. So four to $6,000 in renovations. And that's going to usually be around a, uh, around a, a 2000 to 2010 vintage. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe two thousand, maybe a little bit less, like 2000, 2007 or eight, somewhere around in there. Mm -hmm. um, once you get past that, that's when you start to get into that kind of class A area. Sure. And that's what we're looking for as well as that class A. Mm -hmm. um, that class A, which really there's not very much renovations that all happen on there. Maybe a exterior painting job or something like that. If it's been, you know, five, six, seven year old property, we're not looking for urban class A where you're going to have these really high rents that are, you know, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a month that you might see in Beverly Hills, right? Sure. We're not talking about that, right? We're talking about suburban class A where the average sure. rents are. 1300 to about 16, 1700 dollars a month. So mm -hmm. I kind of call them affordable class A, if you will, right? Sure, sure. And so they're still kind of a very close to that B, B plus kind of range in the market, but they're mm -hmm. they're they definitely have that leg up on the market. Mm -hmm. And we're not looking for assets that are just built last year. We're sure. looking for assets that are stabilized, they have some track record, they have some financial history to them, and that we can actually prove the concept of being able to hold on to that property for another five to seven years. And sure. So those are the kind of assets in the markets that we're looking for. Um, and, 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 and as far as the renovations are concerned, again, when we're doing that value add play, four to $6,000 a door is what our kind of sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. You want to see about a hundred, 125 a month on, 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 as far as a rent premium is concerned after we've, after we've done, after we've done those renovations. Sure. Sure. And, and speaking of that value add and sort of the rent premiums, Dan, um, are you looking specifically for, um, you know, like a true rent growth using your value add or are you maybe 
basing uh, some of your projections on perhaps some organic rent growth as well. What sort of, uh, you, you know, rent growth projections you look for? Are you looking for that maybe perhaps five to 7% uh, actual delta uh, between the existing rents versus, you know, perhaps what you can get on the market and then perhaps, uh, you know, sort of bump it up using your value at strategies as well. What, what, what would you say to some of this? Yeah, so it's a lot of it has to do with the competitive analysis that we do on that property, right? To see, sure. well, what are the other competing properties doing that are similar to this particular property? Mm -hmm. And then what are the other properties doing that are doing what we're already doing, right? And like we don't sure. want to be the first one in the market to do the value add play. Mm -hmm. We really don't like to do that. We would rather sure. find a property that needs value add. And we could say that property over there just did it two years ago and look at the rent premium that they're being able to command, right? Sure. And that mm -hmm. gives them proof of concepts so that when we go to the market, we can say, there's this property over here that did not do the value add play and we're say 30, 40, $50 under market rents mm -hmm. for that. So that's like mm -hmm. your organic rent growth, right? Sure. Or we're under market. And then you have this value add play over here that's already done it and they've got a hundred dollar increase. So we would combine the two of those to kind of close that Delta to kind of see, which one are we going to actually, where can we get, can we get it to that other property where we can close that Delta? Sure. Sure. And how, how do you insulate uh, Dan? Uh, and it kind of gets pretty uh, interesting where, you know, you're obviously playing in, in a uh, sort of, in a high, uh, uh, you know, high value environment. Right. But as you are achieving your rent growth, right. W w what are some of the strategies you do saying that, hey, you know, this rent growth makes perfect sense and we are not going to overspend on your CapEx uh, budget and things like that. How do you sort of protect yourself from, um, you know, not spending a whole lot and perhaps, uh, you know, not getting that, uh, you know, uh, rent growth that you desire? Like, how, how do you sort of insulate yourself from kind of overspending your CapEx budget? Sure. I would say that we, many times you're going to have an overspending, right? Sure. Um, but the nice thing about the way we underwrite, which I recommend everybody to underwrite this way, is to have an expansion on your cap rate when you exit. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that does is it gives you some room for error, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Because right now, the likelihood of you being able to sell at a higher cap rate than where you are, where you're buying it, it's pretty mm -hmm. low. The risk sure. is pretty low there. Sure. So to be able to have that 50, 7,500 basis point spread on the entry cap rate versus the exit cap rate, it gives you that room for error. Okay. Sure. And so mm -hmm. let's say we're going to try to renovate 150 units, but we were trying to plan to spend, you know, hundred, I mean, uh, spend $5,000 a door on each one of those units, but we ended up spending $5,500 a door or $6,000 a door to be able to get the rent premiums that we had projected. Mm -hmm. Well, you might only be able to renovate say 120 of them. So when sure. you go to sell that asset, you now have left some meat on the bone, if you will, for that next buyer and sure. you've proven that concept. So you can still command that lower cap rate on that property. And so it doesn't always have to, it's not always going to be a perfect science. There's sure. always going to be some, some errors there, but as long as you have some conservativeness in your underwriting, it'll leave you some room for error whenever you go to sell that asset. So you can still command the rents on the renovated units, but also still be able to exit at the, at the property, you know, exit price so that you can get the returns for the investors that we're looking for. Sure, sure. Now, speaking of property management, uh, um, uh, Dan, um, how do you sort of go about property management? Is it like third party? And uh, I guess another related question, Dan, would be is that, uh, you know, when you're evaluating the deals, how early are you uh, sort of engaging your property management uh, or, your, you know, are you consulting different property management uh, companies around that area? Can you, can you maybe kind of talk about some of those things? Sure. So right now we have some solid property management companies that we use, two of them primarily that mm -hmm. will manage all of our assets just between the two of them. But in the very beginning, when we were looking for these property management companies, we had to, you know, interview each one of them separately mm -hmm. based on the asset. And that's sure. one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is, is interviewing the property manager based on the asset. Sure. Because there are certain assets, say like, you know, the C class and the lower end Bs that should be managed by one type of property management company, sure. but they're not the right fit for managing an A-class property. It's two sure. different types mm -hmm. of ways to manage those assets. Sure. Same thing if you had somebody who usually managed a, you know, you know, 11 or 10, 12, 20, less than 50 unit property, 
and no on-site maintenance for, in trying to get them to manage a 150 unit property. You, know, you right. gotta, you gotta match the property manager with the actual property and the asset as well. Sure. And also where it's located based on their headquarters. Cause if you have somebody who's located too far away, then it's gonna be harder for them to manage that asset because they're, they're just too far away from the properties to be able to really care. Right. Or sure, want to sure. spend the time to drive, you know, hour, two hours, or I've seen it sometimes up for to eight hours for someone to have to drive to oh, manage boy. a property, which doesn't make sense at all. Right. right? That's impossible. Um, yep. <laughs> it is, it is. So th there's a lot of things that you have to do in the beginning, but I, I, I don't want people that are listening to get overwhelmed with, trying to find a property manager before sure. they find the asset. Sure. Cause it's sure. pretty easy to find a property manager for the most part. Sure. Uh, sure. The hardest ones I would say are probably some of the smaller units where you start to drop below 50 units. Those are probably the harder ones to find. Sure. But I always say find the asset first mm -hmm. and then go find your property manager because sure. you need to know what kind of asset that you're, that you're going to have to manage before you go find that property manager, trying to match that property manager with the asset. Sure, sure. Now, speaking of, you know, sort of the deal analysis, the due diligence, and, you know, how you kind of, uh, you know, take some input uh, of, you know, what the CapEx budget would be and things like that. Uh, so looking at that input, Dan, are you typically perhaps uh, consulting your property managers that you are, uh, or is it more by uh, your own experience now that you can, like, you know, once uh, your group walks the uh, various units, you kind of know that, okay, these are some of the, uh, you know, sort of the value add things that these uh, units need. So you can estimate what the budget would be. So are you kind of consulting your property manager or main company in that? Or is it mostly uh, sort of, you know, like an in-house budget? How, how do you go about that? It's actually a little bit of both. So I'll kind of walk you through how we do it. So one of our managing partners, Brandon Abbott, his background is in construction management as also, and also in, uh, and he actually used to build like high-end custom homes. Mm -hmm. and he also, uh, before he joined us as one of our managing partners, he was a, an insurance adjuster for some of the large national insurance carriers to, you know, when there was a, you know, a, a, a fire in a building or a flood, he'd go in sure. there and you know, you figure out what the CapEx was going to be to renovate the sure. whole place back to where it was before. Mm -hmm. And so he takes his knowledge and background with that and comes up with his own scope of project, scope of work, right? Sure. And what it's going to cost to renovate the interiors. And then we go, before we even share any of that information with the property management company, we tell the property management company, hey, here's the scope of work that you want to have done. How much do you think that we can get it done for? And of sure. course, they use their own background, local knowledge, things like that to figure out what it's going to cost us to be able to renovate. And then we don't share each other's numbers until we're all done, right? Sure, sure, then sure. We, then we actually come together and say, all right, let's go line by line and figure out where we are. Sure. And now, 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 nowadays, we, since we've been working so closely together, we, we get pretty close as far as those numbers are concerned. But sure, sure. That way, we, we want to get buy-in from the property management company because they're the ones that are usually going to be execute executing on that plan sure. they need to make we need to make sure that they're they're on board with it as well that's how we do it with our capex budget sure sure makes makes complete sense there and, and also dan a related question uh, when you are onboarding uh, sort of the uh, new deals um, are you typically keeping the same property management company that was prior or perhaps uh, you change that all the time what is your thought process there so far, we've changed it out on every single one of the properties that we've acquired. So, mm -hmm. um, if it's not if if, it's, if one of our property management companies that we actually use and like was there, mm -hmm. then we would likely keep them. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, it's always been a change of property management. Now, that doesn't mean we always like fire all the staff and bring in new staff. Sometimes sure. that is the case, but. We will usually, when we first take over a property, we will put the staff on a 90 day probationary period where mm -hmm. we can try them out. They can try us out. And if we like them, we'll keep them on. I see. I see. Got it. So I think keeping that culture and making sure whoever is existing can align with and make sure that they can deliver before you kind of, uh, you know, make the shift. Would that be a right way to kind of uh, synthesize Correct. that? Got Correct. it. Yep. And, right. I, and if it was a really poorly performing property, they'd probably go a whole lot sooner, right? Oh, yes. yes. Usually if it's a really poorly performing property, it's usually the on-site staff that's usually the one that's the impact on that. Sure, sure. And, and and for our listeners and viewers, I mean, 
just want to point that out again is that property management is such a key element in this is that those are the boots on the ground on an everyday basis and that's kind of the face of uh, you know sort of your investment that you know performance is uh, absolutely closely tied with how they perform and how they sort of you know meet and greet the customers and what sort of culture they have uh, would you agree that absolutely property management is 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 key, very very vital and key and the moment you start to find that a property management company is not working you've got to get rid of them and put somebody else in that place as soon as possible because it will make or break a deal for sure Absolutely. Absolutely. Now and that kind of goes to the asset management side of things and making sure that from the asset management side of things, you're making sure that you look at those numbers on a, on a consistent basis to make sure that the property management company is actually doing the responsibilities that they need to be doing. Sure, sure, sure. And, and since you brought that up, Dan, l let's talk about the key numbers that perhaps, uh, you know, sort of how you track some things on a weekly basis from an asset management perspective. Let, let's just go there. Sure, sure. So every week, every week we have a phone call with the property management company. Mm -hmm. And on that phone call, we are getting an update from them about the, how the renovations are performing. We're also getting an update from them about the, 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 the traffic from the prior week. Mm -hmm. And we get that we do this phone call on a weekly basis. So and we always try to have it done on Mondays, but mm -hmm. at the very latest on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do it at the end of the week. Because usually on those phone calls, we're talking about the prior week. Sure. So if I don't have a phone call until Thursday or Friday about the prior week, then the next week is already shot too. Right? Sure, sure. So Absolutely. I want, to try to, I want to try to impact that change in the beginning of the week if I can and set the tone for that entire week and set those goals for that entire week as well. Sure. So we're, we're looking at the traffic on the property from the prior week. We're looking at any of the notices to vacate and, and renewals that have happened. We're looking at the budgeted occupancy, the current budgeted occupancy, and then also the current occupancy. And then we mm -hmm. look at the 60, the 30, 60, and 90 day trended, trending occupancy. So we mm -hmm. keep, have an eye on how, how it's looking into the future. And then we also keep track of each one of the marketing avenues that are coming, that the leads are coming in from. Mm -hmm. And then the closing ratio of each one of the, the on-site staff. So it's usually a leasing agent or two or three, depending on the size of the property. And then, of course, the, the actual on-site property manager, too, and keeping track of their closing ratios to see, do we have an issue with one of the leasing people not being able to close leads that are coming in? And then we also have a software, a CRM that uh, the property management companies use to be able to keep track of the leads so they can make sure they're following up with them as well until they actually can close it out because they've actually leased somewhere else or as have as how, or they have leased with us. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that detail, Dan. And and speaking of marketing there, Dan, uh, is it something that uh, the marketing is pretty much uh, hands off being done by property management company itself? Or do you have any other auxiliary services perhaps that are kind of driving that marketing and lead generation mechanism? So most of it is done by the property management company, if not all of it, right? Mm -hmm. We still keep an eye on it. So we'll, we will do a monthly review and audit of the, the listings, like say on apartments.com and things like that, apartment ratings to make sure that reviews are being handled. And they're supposed to be doing all that, but we want to make sure from the asset management side of things that we're looking at that, that information, making sure that if we're updating pictures, that the proper pictures are being out up front and in front of the, up front of the apartments.com listing. And for example, I, we just did a review on one of our properties where we updated some of the images. Well, sure. the first image of the property was of the old kitchen on one of our renovated units, right? <laughs> um, well, we, we, even though we still have those units, that's not the one we want to present, right? Sure, we sure. want to make sure we're presenting the newly renovated property because that's what's going to attract those new residents into that property that are willing sure. to pay a little bit more for that, for that, for that, for that, for that, for that unit as well. Sure, sure. Now, uh, uh, Dan, your group is now approaching almost 2,500 units in closer uh, markets there. Have you ever given consideration to perhaps taking the property management outside of the umbrella in-house or maybe, uh, you know, buying a stake in one of the property management locally there? Uh, what are some of your thoughts or what, what sort of considerations go into some of these type of decisions? So I would probably say just about every week we're thinking about that, right? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, a lot of people might think, you know, that we think about that from the profitability standpoint. And overall, it's not really from the profitability of having like a property management company that's making money. Sure. It's really to be able, because 
almost everybody that I've consulted with that has their own vertically integrated property management, they don't make a lot of money off of it, right? Sure, sure. Most, mm -hmm. most of where they make money off of it is having the better control of their asset that allows them to be able to keep a better eye on their asset. Sure. And, and have, making sure that their team has that ownership mentality because the way the third party property management works is that staff does not actually work for me or work for us with our sure. property. It actually works with a property management company, right? Very so true. their ownership mm -hmm. mentality is with the property management company and mm -hmm. not necessarily with us as the investors. And so it does give you a little bit better alignment of interest when you have your own. Um, but we, and so we, ha we have discussed it. We will likely do it into the end of the future, but we will, like you mentioned, we will likely buy or acquire an existing property management company to reduce that learning curve and go ahead and have all those systems and processes in place from day one instead of trying to reinvent that wheel. But in people that I've consulted with, you really need to have about four to 5,000 units in a particular market for mm -hmm. it to even make sense to be able to do it, to be able to yeah. have the efficiencies and the economies of scale necessary to be able to make it make sense. And so at this point, we're not at that point yet. So we're not going to do going down that route, but I, I think about it a lot. So sure, I know sure. in, in the future, it will be one of those things that we will bring in house. Sure, sure. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. And, and, and couldn't agree more that that control and those savings lead to so much of, uh, you know, sort of the improvement uh, of culture in general. And, 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 you know, of course, we can sort of, again, correlate on a long term that it leads to so much profitability. And, and you said it right, that property management sometimes, uh, you know, when it's external, it's it's you just don't have the control or they they are like that staff is not dedicated enough and then obviously when you bring it in in house it's it's completely a different ball game for sure you know and, and again it's not a profit center it's more of control and savings that can effectively give you some edge in the market for sure so thank you for that detail yeah. Dan uh, now Dan speaking of uh, you know big deals raising capital and things like that. Uh, your group went from, uh, you know, like a smaller, um, uh, you know, a relatively smaller modest deal first to now like bigger deals. You just mentioned that your group closed uh, a $51 million deal in the midst of COVID. So, so the rise has been rapid. The amount of capital that you have, uh, you know, sort of raised is, uh, uh, is phenomenal. So I definitely want to congratulate you there. Uh, but uh, give us some tips on, uh, what are some of the things that uh, some uh, syndicators can do to raise more capital and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, kind of provide more uh, services and kind of, uh, you know, take it, uh, take it there as to what your thoughts are. Sure. I would say the number one thing is having a multimodal approach to be able to, to attract new investors into your fold. And then no, actually three things. So number one would be having that multimodal approach and then being able to put systems in place to keep them close to you. Mm -hmm. And then also being consistent. So those are the three things being consistent with whatever those marketing avenues are. I sure. see so many people do starting one thing and then they, they just stop because they sure. don't see the results. But if they just stay consistent with it, they will continue to see, they will start to see those results as they are consistent with it. But being able to build that fence around them once you once you get them around you, because you spend all this time, energy, and effort to get somebody to say, "Hey, I'm an investor. I want to rate. I want. I want to. You know, invest in your next project." But then they never hear from you for three, four, five, six, nine months down the road until you have that next deal. Well, you need to put systems in place to make sure that they are actually hearing from you at multiple points throughout that time pro time frame to be able to keep them as close to you as possible so that they're ready for that next deal. Like we have investors right now, we haven't had a deal since, you know, May 15th is when we closed that last deal. It's right now it's, you know, July 21st. We haven't had another deal, but I'm getting emails every day from investors. Hey, I got money to place, you know, where, where, do, when's your next deal? And you know, I don't really have a good answer for them because sure. we're in the middle of COVID and I don't want really to know when the next deal is going to come. Sure, but sure. I always tell them that we're not just going to get into a deal just to get a deal. Sure, so sure. Just stay on the sidelines. You can continue to receive our material where you, we send out a, a mail newsletter every month, things like that, so that they can stay in contact with us. But that's why they're reaching out to us because we're staying in contact with them and making sure that they feel like they're more a part of our family and they have a relationship with us and they're not just a number. 
incredible incredible so you have a great problem you have lots of money you just don't have the deals but perhaps give us some detail then in terms of you know the fence you talked about or the, some of the automation that goes behind this could you maybe share some details about you know sort of what sort of framework someone should look into and lay out and some of the automation pieces that come along with this sure so one of the softwares that we use is a software called active campaign and it does help with some of the automation but I would pers I am a big believer in a high touch investor relations process. Sure. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we do is not automated. Now, when we talk about automation, like we have this, if you're watching the video portion of, we have these printed newsletters that we mail sure. out every single month, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, these are automatically sent to them because we send it out through our mail house and they get sent out, right? That's automated. But when it comes to like automating any type of scheduling or meetings or anything like that, I have an assistant who actually will call all of our investors Whenever they go to our website, they go to passiveinvestor.com, they fill out that passive investor foot club form. I'll jump on a phone or she'll jump on a phone call with them first and say, you know, she doesn't even email them first, right? Sure. She gets, she, she call them right away and say, this is Ann. I wanted to schedule an appointment with Dan Hanford, one of our managing partners to discuss your investment goals to see if you're the right fit for us. And she'll schedule that appointment. If for some reason she doesn't get a hold of them, at that point, she'll send them an email and then we add them to our email list. We add them to our, our mailing address list for this, for the actual printed newsletter. And then I jump on a phone call with them and ask them about their goals and, and kind of start to build that relationship with them. Sure. Every single one of our investors has my personal cell phone number so mm -hmm. that they have any questions or any issues into the future. I want them to feel like they have that access to me. Sure. And I also, when I'm traveling around the country, I'll reach out to them to ask them if I'm traveling to their area. So I just came back from a family trip to, to Tampa, Florida area. And so I pull up on my phone, all my investors that are located in that Tampa, Tampa, Florida, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, you know, Orlando area. And because I was there for an extended period of time, yeah. I did an investor dinner there in a couple of different places. And I, you know, met with some of our investors for, for breakfast and lunch and things like that. So to deepen those relationships and really treat them as, as, as people and not just as, you know, as a number. Sure, sure. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's always a pleasure to kind of network with you. And uh, I know we, we are just about time for our, uh, for our uh, episode here. But share with our listeners like some of your best advice that you have so far received from whether it was your mentors, your colleagues, or, uh, you know, some of the networking events. What are some of your top advice uh, before we go? So the top two ones I would say first is what I talked about earlier on is learning to delegate earlier on so that you can focus on what you're really good at and what you're really skilled at. And then number two is measuring everything that you do, because if you can't measure it, then you can't manage it. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, kindly share with the listeners how they can find you and learn more about your company and everything. Sure, sure. So um, you can go to passiveinvesting.com to uh, find out more information about us. There's a bio information about me and our other two partners. And then you can also look at our portfolio on there and see some of the other assets that we've acquired. And you can also on that top right hand corner of the page, you click on that big blue button that says join the passive investor club. And uh, that'll allow us to be able to have a conversation to see if we're right fit for you. Because so we're not the right fit for everybody, but I want to make sure that I talk to you and, and discuss those goals with you first. And then if you're interested in just learning more about multifamily, you can just go to multifamilyinvestornation.com, sign up for our free weekly email list. We do a weekly webinar, weekly webinar every single week. It's free and it's just to be able to provide some additional value to, to those, those who are interested in learning more about multifamily. Thank you so much again for having me on here, Sakar. I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to seeing you succeed as well. Thank you so much. And for our viewers and listeners, I want to mention uh, Dan's podcast, Multifamily Investor Nation, is one of the top podcasts uh, on Apple iTunes. The amount of knowledge, the guests, and the webinars that Dan mentioned are incredible. There are a lot of advanced topics. There are a lot of uh, you know newbie topics for a lot of passive investors as well to learn. I personally enjoy uh, you know sort of uh, uh, friendship and relationship with Dan and knowing you know some of the things that uh, their group does is always an inspiring uh, thing to see. So thanks a lot for your time, Dan. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, uh, you know for uh, investors and listeners of the podcast, you can always find us at premiumcashflow.com where we have news articles and of course the expert guests like Dan uh, who are always you know featured from time to time uh, so please head on to us and if you are interested in 
learning more and perhaps uh, see how passive investments work, uh, kindly, you know, register yourself. We can always, uh, you know, jump on a short phone call and understand what your goals are and see if we can, uh, you know, align and uh, sort of help you out with that. So it's been a pleasure, Dan. Thanks for coming on today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Sakar. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.